Galatians 3, verses 23 to 29. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God, through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Praise God for the reading of his word. You may now be seated. We continue our series on Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. And the title of today's sermon is Heirs by Faith. Let's look back at what Paul has been discussing before verse 23. Paul explained that God gave the law, the Old Testament law, to reveal sin. Because he was answering the question, then what is the purpose of the law? If what you're saying that we are justified by faith and not the law... So what's the role of the law? And if you started chapter 1 with us, you would appreciate the discussion of Paul explaining line by line, explaining to the audience, the one who received the letter, the importance of faith in Christ and that we are justified by faith alone. What does justify mean? It assumes that the human race is guilty. Everyone is guilty of sin. And everyone needs to be justified, but not everyone will be justified. Because we are guilty, we need justification. And that process or that event that justifies us the center of that is a sacrifice of Christ on the cross, yet not everybody will experience justification because, as Paul explained, we are justified by faith. And when he mentioned faith, he was not talking about a religion. Like today, we use faith like, what's your faith? You're talking about an affiliation to a religion. But for Christ, it is that belief, that overwhelming belief that you believe in what he did more than yourself, more than what you think, more than man, more than anything else, that that truly justifies a person, that you believe as well in his call to repent of your sins. It's to believe in his suffering, death, and resurrection. And it is also to believe that we must repent of our sins and turn away from what is sin. Because if you truly believe, you will repent. And if you truly will repent, it only is because you believed. Now, he was trying to address this problem because... He went through a certain area in Galatia, south of Galatia, and he, he preached the gospel of Christ. Yet somebody came after him trying to change the minds of those he taught. And the message was, you are saved, yes, by faith, but also by works of the law. It means it's not only your faith, but also your obedience to the law. They are equal, and you will be saved through that. And Paul was saying, no, no, no. Obedience is a manifestation, as he will explain later, if the Holy Spirit is truly in you. But obedience does not save. 
It's faith alone that saves and obedience is a result because you believe. It's a result because the spirit comes within you and transforms you. Therefore, you want to obey. Not because you will be saved because I will do a lot of work. So my good works, my point, it, you think it's a point system. And Paul is saying, no, it's not a point system. That if you obey a lot of parts of the law, you'll be saved. He said, no, you're guilty in one, then you're guilty. It's just like the Philippine law, you know. If you commit murder, you're still violated the law, just one. You don't pay your taxes, then you violated the law. Sorry. Let's stick to topic. <laughs> we are all guilty. Now, then, but Paul was trying to address the other problem of his statement because some might be thinking, now, if we are justified by faith and not the law, then what's the purpose of the law? And he addressed it previously in the previous verses as we discussed last Sunday, that the law was made for transgression, meaning to reveal what sin is. Because before the law, there was no spotlight or magnifying glass on what is sin. And that's sort of a negative thing about the law because it showed us that we were sinners. But there's also a positive thing about the law and Paul will be explaining it. Yes, it revealed we were sinners because we needed to know it. You know, some of us who preach the gospel and a lot of you, you know, the most difficult person when we're sharing the gospel is the person who believes he is good enough. Yeah, he's good enough. I don't hurt anybody. I'm a nice guy. In fact, I help other people. That's why I think I'm going to heaven. And that's a problem because Paul is saying, we're all guilty. And Paul is saying, I am the chief sinner. Oh, you don't know who Paul was. He's like, he was a Pharisee. He was a very religious person in his time. He's, he's one of those up there, a doctoral, a doctorate in their religion and a zealot. He could say, uh, compared to others, uh, I could say I'm a good boy to the law, but no, he, what he was saying was, I'm the chief of the sinners. And that's why some people who already believe they're sinners, sometimes it's, it's simpler to explain the gospel to them because they already believe the first part, right? Yeah, I'm a sinner. I said, great, so am I. And that's why we need Christ. Now, Paul is saying there's no contradiction between the law and faith. Okay? He's explaining that it has a purpose. Without compromising his teaching that it's faith alone, we are justified by faith, not by works. It's not equal. Yet he is saying there was a purpose. In fact, it does not contradict, but it complements the Abrahamic covenant. Remember his discussion on God making a covenant with Abraham and God making a covenant with Israel through Moses as intermediary, but God made a covenant directly with Abraham. And he's saying that there is no contradiction here because it was really the Abrahamic covenant. The Old Testament covenant is in preparation of the coming of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant is Christ. But there was a need for the law. Well, he explained that the law functioned as a prison to set boundaries. We need to have boundaries. Do you know without the law? Because the law of Moses was a civil law, a moral law, and a ceremonial law. Three things. In the Philippines, we have one, the civil law. 
in their country, they had three. And when you say the law, it's all of them. But sometimes when Paul is saying the law, he's mentioning one of them. Now, these are needed for the civil law to put boundaries. Because if there are no boundaries, we are like the wild, wild west. Now, the ceremonial law prepares the coming of Christ. Because didn't you even ask when you were growing up as a religious person, uh, why does he have to die again? What's the connection uh, for me? So you're just saying he taught nice things and he died for it. So which making Christ an ordinary person like any other good teacher. But once you understand the ceremonial law where innocent animals must take your place every year, animals who have nothing to do with your sin must die for you. And it had to be done every year. Where in the book of Hebrews says you don't have to do that anymore because Christ, the true Lamb of God, innocent in every way, took your place he had nothing to do with your sin, but he took upon it himself. But he himself, because he had no sin, therefore death could not hold him. Therefore, he had to resurrect from the dead. Now, he's saying faith in what he did. He fulfilled the law. What does that mean, he fulfilled the law? When Christ said, I do not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, what does that mean? It means he obeyed every part of it. 100%. Which we could not, which Israelites could not. Because the only animal that can be sacrificed, well, should have nothing to do with your sin. Well, most animals, or all animals. But Paul is saying there was a purpose for the law. The ceremonial law was there to give us an understanding of the justice of God, which will be revealed in Christ. And of course, the moral law, which includes the Ten Commandments. That we are guilty of as well. Are you guilty of idolatry? Idolatry is not just a statue you bow down to or you pray to. Idolatry is anything higher than God in your life. Have you ever lied? Have you lied once? As a kid, I lied so many times to my parents. Have you ever lied to your wife or husband? That makes us guilty. Now, Paul was saying in these verses that we've read that aside from the law's purpose to reveal sin, the law was like a prison, and the law also functioned as a tutor, a mentor, a guardian, or a governess. I remember a, a film where the lead one of the lead characters had to hire a nun or a former nun to govern his children because his wife died. There had to be a governess to watch over the children. The law also, well, the law or the governess or the tutor should teach us what, what the law is. So f one day perhaps, we would understand when Christ came. And we would understand why John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why we would understand why he had to die instead of the conquering king that would restore political order to Israel. That he became the one that needed to be sacrificed for us. Why? Because God is both a just God and a loving God. It's the same way I keep telling people who can't understand the concept is this. If you have an earthly judge and his relative committed something wrong. An earthly judge, what do you expect from an earthly judge? 
You expect the earthly judge to be righteous in his judgment. That if his own relative committed something wrong against the law, that he will render the necessary consequence of that. That is a righteous judge. Now, God is a righteous judge. The ceremonial law revealed that there must be a sacrifice. Now, God found a way for his justice and mercy to meet both fulfilled. And that was only fulfilled in Christ. But make no mistake, we're not talking about universal salvation because Christ died, all humanity will be saved. No, we are justified by faith. As one preacher said, uh, Mr. Sprawl, that the death of Christ was sufficient for all mankind. But it will only be efficient to those who believe. Because not everybody would believe. First point, prison and guardian. Paul explained that the law held them captive. In other words, imprisoned. Imprisoned with established boundaries. The law also functioned as a guardian or tutor until Christ came. And why should Christ come so that one may find justification by faith? Let's read verses 23 and 24. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now, listen, in those days, in those days, this was how education worked. A father will hire a tutor for his son. His son will work in the household like the other slaves. He will be trained. He will be trained like everybody else. But the difference is there is a tutor. They don't spoil their children then. There is a tutor who will teach him philosophy, will teach him economics. The word did not exist yet, but there is such a thing. Who will teach him governance, who will teach him how things work and how the business works. There would be a tutor. And mind you, King Philip of Macedon hired a tutor for his son Alexander. His name was Aristotle. That was the pattern. Now, a tutor teaches the child until a certain age that the father says, I want him back. When he's back, he's now treated as a son. Before, he would be treated like everybody else, must be employed, must contribute to the household, must contribute to the family. But once he has learned, he has proven himself and he has learned enough, then he can be an heir to the wealth of the father. Now, the Mosaic law revealed sin, but it provided no way out. It established boundaries of what they cannot do. The boundaries are limits. Like children, they were given limits. Israel were given limits. Or the, the people of Israel. The law became a guardian or teacher for a time. Until the revelation of Christ. Until we understand faith in Christ. The do's and don'ts had to be there. The moral law had to be there. The civil law had to be there. The ceremonial law to make us understand of how this justification works needed to be there. So the law was like a prison. When you say prison, don't think jail cell, okay? 
Have you heard about the island prison? I think it's somewhere in Palawan. It's an amazing story. They were taught agriculture. And I heard some of them don't even want to leave anymore because they really enjoyed agriculture. <laughs> they became productive. Now we have prisons. It, it's not specifically a jail cell. It's a prison. It has boundaries. In the same way, the law of God is like a boundary. The Mosaic law was like a boundary, but it was also a teacher. So Paul was giving different analogies to make people understand the purpose of the law. It was a prison and guardian. Now, Paul talks about becoming children of God. And that's the next point, children of God. Paul referred to a practice where a father would hire mentors to teach his son until a certain age. Then the mentor would return the son to the father. Because of Christ, there is no need for the law as a tutor. Verse 25 to 27, let's read that. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And of course, those they baptize are those who have faith in him. I, I hope that's clear. If you don't have faith in him, real faith in him, and you were baptized, what happened? Nothing. You just got wet. All right? But if you truly have faith in him and you were baptized into Christ, it says there it's like you put on Christ. Sometimes putting on the right clothes gives you the right effect. Yeah, and our loved ones complain when we don't, when we don't dress very well, right? Why do you look like that? <laughs> But when you put the right clothes, it has the right effect. Now, uh, faith is within. But being baptized, it's like putting on something. While well, you are now publicly declaring that you belong to Christ. There are witnesses now. That's why in baptism in water, there should be... You cannot self-baptize. You know, I baptize myself in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit... You don't do that. There must be another witness, at least one. Who's that? The one baptizing you. And we add a little more to the celebration. So it has to, there has to be some witnesses. Because now you're, you're, you're going out. You're proclaiming, I belong to him. I'm no longer that, that secret guy. Are you a Christian? Mm, maybe. <laughs> Afraid of your peers, huh? Do we bullied? Well, they were persecuted because of their faith in Christ, and they were willing to go public about it. Now, before it was about the tutor, but now it is about faith in Christ and what he did. No longer about the prison. No longer about the spotlight. No longer about the mentor, because the one, the father, or the one to whom we must belong has come. Through faith in Christ, one becomes a child of God. And all who are baptized into him are clothed in him. Through faith, they become children of God. And let's jump to verse 28 to 29 to just strengthen that point. Now, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. We'll get back to the, that discussion later. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Again, the Abrahamic covenant. Heirs, according to promise. The heirs, tagapagmana, are not only the Jewish people. Through faith in Christ, we became children of Abraham, as Paul had been discussing all along. Now, we are Abraham's heirs in Christ through faith. There is no difference between the Jew or Gentile. That's what is, what's Paul was saying. 
Remember, the real issue here is that these people from Jerusalem, Judaizers, were trying to convince these Gentiles that they have to follow the law to be saved, that it is a requirement, and to a point that Peter was influenced with peer pressure, that Paul had to rebuke Peter and say, hey, your actions do not support the gospel. Then he had to argue that it's not about circumcision or following the law that makes you Abraham's offspring or heir. It's faith in Christ that makes you an heir of Christ. All who believe are one in Christ, Jew and Gentile. And through faith in Christ, Abraham's descendants, heirs, to the promise. Therefore, the Gentiles should reject. What should the Galatian Gentiles do? Reject the bewitching or deception from the Judaizers. What deception? They're adding the law. Hey, it's faith and obedience to the law. Are you deceived with that as well? That somebody tells you it's faith and then your obedience. No, it's faith alone. But do you have to obey? Of course. But the obedience does not save you. You obey because you are a child. Not because you want to earn your points to heaven. And there's a difference why you obey your parents. Because you are a son. Because you are a daughter. That's why you obey your parents. Not because you need to earn your, your place in the home. No, no matter what my children do. I have no choice. They're my children. But I expect them to obey. Should they obey? Of course. Through faith, we are children of God. It's faith alone that saves. But do we have to obey? Of course. But the obedience is not the factor that justifies us. The same way, it's not the obedience of your, of your child that makes him your child. Now, I'd like to ask you, are you following me in trying to understand the author? Who is Paul? Are we getting this? Well, I'm trying. Because every Sunday, Paul is saying, showing different angles to the same thing, okay? It's been what? Half the year now, right? <laughs> We've been dealing with Galatians for half the year. So if somebody asks you, how are you saved? Is it, is it faith and works? Yes or no? The answer is no. It's faith alone. But if they ask you, should you obey? Yes, but it does not save you. It now becomes who you are. That's why you obey. It becomes part of your nature and position in Christ. That's why you obey. But if you have no heart to obey, maybe faith isn't real yet. If you have no heart to follow God, maybe your faith isn't real. You just think you have faith, but it's fake. If there are fake news, there's fake faith. Because true faith has full conviction that one must believe. And if you truly believe, you believe in Christ. And what did Christ say? Follow me. And you follow him. Because you believe, you follow. Let's remove the deception. If somebody says faith and works equal salvation, that's a deception. According to Paul, it's faith alone. Should you live moral lives? Of course, but morality does not save. It does not. Morality should be the fruit, the fruit because you are in Christ. 
Now, if you believe that um, it's harmless, you know, those who believe faith and works and those who believe faith alone. No, it's not harmless. It's harmless because Paul said, let them be accursed. Let them be cursed to believe that. And Paul said, who has bewitched you as if you were manipulated by a false teaching. And Paul calls them false brothers. Take note. I didn't say that. Paul did. Application. Prisoners no more. Let us acknowledge the purpose of the law. Which is to reveal sin. And set boundaries. Yet let us experience liberty. Through faith in Christ. I really enjoy Galatians because I don't have to be under the law. You know, if I have to be under the law, I can't eat pork. If I'm under the law, I can't. And I can't eat the blood that comes from it. That's why they say Galatians is, the main theme is Christian liberty. The liberty we have in Christ. But let us not live as if we are under the law. And some of us create our own law of what a Christian should be. First, verify what is in Scripture. Then stick to that. Don't add. Because Pharisees like to add. When Jesus confronted them, you have given them laws that you yourself don't lift. But then he also corrected them in terms of adding stuff. The minor, focusing on the minor rather than the major. Let us experience liberty through faith in Christ. Since the law no longer imprisons us, let us live as if we are still. Let us not live as if we are still under the law. Now, let me explain. The immature little kids need what boundaries, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had a little kid at home? If you don't put boundaries, they're going to hurt themselves. Hmm? Especially if you live on the third floor. Oh, I'm going to play climb. I'm going to climb. I'm going to climb down. No, no, no. That no, you cannot. And you have to keep reminding. Hmm? And they want to touch everything, like the socket. They want to put their finger there, right? Have you had little kids like that? Then they want to taste everything, right? They even want to put their tongue on the freezer wall inside. You know that some mothers had to think chemistry. How do I remove the tongue right now? Because it, it stuck. The children need that boundary. They have to be told again and again, don't do, you can do, but don't, don't, don't. Adults, you don't have to because they know. Right? Well, except adults who think like children. Some have actually died playing a guitar at the balcony of their high-rise condominium, and he slipped, and he died. Well, not all adults are wise. The law is made for children. Those who have faith should think differently now. Those who have faith do not want to commit adultery, even though they could be tempted, but they don't want to. They should not want to. Why? Because being in Christ, there is that Holy Spirit that guides you. And there is the word of God that you desire. The immature need boundaries or rules for their protection. Now, let us move on to maturity from the law to Christ. It begins by genuine faith. By believing in the gospel. 
that's when you're no longer a prisoner of the law. Next is to be mature in Christ. Again, the immature need a guardian or a governess. But the mature know how to lead themselves. For a time, the law became the teacher of the coming of the Messiah and the need for him. Yes, the law showed us we're sinners. Therefore, we need a savior. But if we are in Christ, we know Christ has already come. Now, God meant for the Mosaic law as a temporary tutor, but not a forever tutor. Christ is eternal, and those who believe in him have eternal life. But those who do not are already condemned. Last point, glorify God. Through faith in Christ, God made a spark of the promise to Abraham. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, male and female, rich and poor. All who believe become heirs to the promise. Let us glorify God for his plan. This was his plan. Not only Israel, but even the Gentiles. Male, female, rich or poor. Now, in what way may we glorify him? Because we should glorify him. Well, let us give thanks with all our hearts that we were included by faith in Christ. How else? Let us carefully study the truth so we can appreciate it carefully so that we may proclaim it. Let us live and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give you a poem right now. Same title, heirs by faith. Like land surrounded by the seas, the law established boundaries. Think of it as protective rules made for teens and those in preschools. Like a governess to children, the law was like a mentor then. A temporary arrangement until Christ, the real replacement for our sins. In Christ, we are all God's children. Through faith in him, we say amen. By faith, be sons of Abraham, say, heirs to the promise I am. Thus we praise him with all our hearts. On biblical thoughts, we depart. It is a desire of our soul to follow cause he made us whole. Let us all rise. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. For this day, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is powerful. It is real. Thank you for the truth that we are justified by faith alone. We can never earn our way to you. Nobody can. Everybody is guilty. Forgive us if we thought we were righteous enough, for no one is. Forgive us for thinking that the transformation in our lives is because of our own strength. Teach us to be humble always, knowing we are saved by grace through faith alone, because of Christ alone based on the scripture alone so that we may glorify you alone oh lord that we may understand and may it be clear as daylight in our minds and we see it is good it is good news no need to earn our way because that is not the way the way is christ and faith in him the perfect sacrifice one who committed no sin the only one who fulfilled the law and we rely on his good works not ours on his sacrifice not ours yet because our faith is real allow us to grow 
in good works, allow us to grow in obedience, allow us to follow, because we are now your sons and daughters. We are now heirs to Abraham through Christ, belonging to the promise that Abraham is blessed so that he may be a blessing to the nations. Thank you, Father. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of His Spirit be with you all. God's people say, Amen. God bless you. Good morning.